Good morning, and welcome to Battling the Bear. I'm Tom Koch, who is the, uh, the co-host of Talking Real Money and Regional Director for Appella Capital, formerly known as Vestry. And on my right is, uh, well, I'll tell you the story of how, you probably don't even remember this, because it was a long time ago. In 1988, I was programming a radio station here in uh, Seattle, and we put the Business Radio Network, which was a, a channel that did stock quotes and all that stuff, and had various experts on. And one day I was driving down the road, and playing on my station was Paul Merriman. They were interviewing you on the national, the national feed. And they said, Paul Merriman's from Seattle. I thought, never heard of this guy. This was 1988. So I called him up. We did some work together. He very kindly brought me into his practice in 1998. And uh, I was proud to work with Paul and everyone else at Merriman, which is still a great company right across the water here. And uh, until 2009, when Don McDonald and I founded, uh, founded Vestry. So um, I'm lucky to have had Paul in my life in many, many ways, especially in terms of my career, because uh, I was a journalist. And this, frankly, and I get to kind of do both, because I get to do the radio show, the podcast, and help people one-on. It's really, it's a, it's a great, and, and frankly, the, the more gratifying work is working with you one at a time. It's really, it's really a joy. So... Um, so today, today's going to be a little different than what we normally do. Normally somebody gets up here and does 90 minutes or two hours, but today we're going to go back and forth on a few topics. Um, if you have questions, we'd love to have them as well. We're going to take questions from the internet where we have several hundred people. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Um, we all know the restrooms are down that way somewhere, which no longer require a key. Uh, please help yourself to refreshments. And our goal is to finish by somewhere around 10.30. Uh, we will stay and answer your questions for a period of time after that. Paul says he'll stay all day if necessary. I've got to go do the radio show at, uh, I've got to leave somewhere closer to 11. My partner, Don McDonald, came down with COVID this week, oh. so he's not, not feeling well. But anyway, so, um, so we're going to go through all these things for you. We have a handout that you should have that looks like this, right? Uh, that's got a number of tables in it, some other information. Don't steal my stuff either. Um, and I will say that uh, as well, we are here to help you wherever you are on your journey. Should that mean you want help with an advisor? Terrific, we're happy to do that. Should that mean you just want a review of your situation? Happy to do that. If you don't want anything, happy to do that too. But we've given you a ton of information in addition to today and Paul's book is there, and the CDs. How many people still play CDs? All right, all right. look at all those hands. That's great. Cassette tapes. Well, we have those as well. <laughs> if you want anything from us today, please fill out this form and give it to us. We offer our podcast, which we'll sign you up for. We offer a free meeting with an advisor, which we will give you actual help about your situation and make sure you're doing everything you can to pull for your retirement or investing, or all those things. We just sometimes you just look at your 401k and say, buy this fund, this fund, this fund, and get on with your life. So we're here to help you. Um, and that's frankly where my partner, uh, my colleague, it really comes from, because he's a guy who retired, what, about 10 years ago officially. He, he uh, set up the Merriman Foundation, which is designed to help everybody, all investors, all ages, young people, which we hope invest when they're young, older people. Uh, and he's done it with articles and podcasts and books. One of the books he's got right here he's giving you. Um, but it is truly an honor for me to be on the stage uh, with somebody who I think you would all agree is really an expert in this field, but also truly been a great friend for these 30 plus years. Please give a warm hand to Paul Merriman. Paul. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I was actually going to pretend I could not get out of the chair. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell you, working with Tom Cock was absolutely one of the joys of my, of my life. And uh, we have, within our foundation, a whole bunch of things that we do. Podcasts, articles, books, videos. And then we also have identified what we call truth tellers, people who are reaching out to educate that we think are teaching the right thing, the thing at least that we are comfortable with, the, with the things that we would expect to come out of the academic community. 
which is one of the, the forks in the road that we have to face as investors, and maybe one of the biggest forks in the road in terms of the lifetime impact. Do we choose to follow Wall Street? Do we choose to follow Main Street? Main Street being our neighbors, our friends, our folks at the, at, at the office that we might talk with about investing? Or do we follow the work of University Street, which is the academic community? And from my experience, uh, for almost, I think, 60 years now, I just turned 79, so yes, I started investing 60 years ago. From my experience, uh, the academic community, while they don't all agree, which shouldn't shock us, but it is the, the most dependable source of information that I know. They know the past at a level that nobody else does. Or if they do, they don't tell you. And so uh, I, I think the work that Tom and Don and firms, my, my firm, my old firm, I've been out of the business for 10 years uh, when I started the foundation, but, uh, but, but their commitment to the academic work is, is the same. So Tom gave me some topics that, I, that he thought that I would like to cover, uh, and he knows my work, I think, pretty well. And I said yes in a, in, in a minute. And um, let me make sure I got this. Uh... Now, Tom, you know me and computers. Can you figure that out? Yes. Watch this. Oh, you're amazing. And you're up on the next slide. And you get your pen back. And how do I get that next slide? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Okay, you really, wanted, you really want a story? When I came to work with Paul in 1998, he was still using overheads. You remember overheads where you write on the thing? And I told him, we had to go to a computer, and he said, no way, man, we are never going to a computer. But we did, so. And if we had overheads here today, I'd be so happy. <laughs> anyway, how to manage your portfolio in a bear market. By the way, the answer to that, that title could be the same answer as how to manage a mark, your portfolio in a bull market. Because the idea is to build a portfolio for all the time. But I think the thing that is unique about the bear market is because it attacks an emotional part of us that is so different, I'm talking chemically, according to the experts, than how we feel when the market's going up. Think about how we feel when we buy a lottery ticket. We actually can, for a few seconds, have, a, have this picture of we win. And we know the probabilities may be 300 million to one against us, but we still have a chemical reaction that, impl that implies something that is, is good. And loss, that's the other side of the coin, we have a different a set of, re of responses. So here's what I know about bear markets. I know that they are normal. They are the part not only of the market for as long as we know the market. Bear markets are what bear markets represent, a period where we're not doing as well as we were before, except in the case of a bear market, they put a number of a 20% decline but we face bear markets all the time in our regular life. We face bear markets in our marriages, we face bear markets at work, and we also face bull markets. But the bears are the hardest to deal with. What I know about the bear markets is about the past. And that is the work that Tom and our firm, our foundation, that's what we do. We look. We look at the past going all the way back to 1928. And when we go all the way back to 1928, what we know is you get a bear market about every 3.6 years. But that's an average. And there's the old story about the kid who drowned walking across a river where the average depth was two feet. Average, it can be so misleading. How old we are likely to be will often read the average. I am not stopping there. And I want you to know that along with that average of one every 3.6 years, you're going to lose, on average, 36%. 
But twice in between 2000 and 2009, we lost over 50% on the S&P 500. And by the way, typically when you're hearing about a discussion about bear markets, you're talking about the S&P 500. And it's also important to note, they do not include the reinvestment of dividends. So bear markets can be bad, but they're not quite as bad as they say because they're not including that money that you made in dividends. So 36% once every 3.6 years, but wait a minute. Is it worse at sometimes other than others? Well, yeah, from 1928 to 1945, there was a bear market every 1.4 years. How would that be emotionally? How do you think people felt about investing back then? Hardly anybody wanted to be part of it. It wasn't really until the, the, the 50s and 60s that the public was coming in more seriously in investing for the long term. But from 1988 to 1999, there was no bear market. Not one. So we can talk about the average. We can be emotionally prepared for it. But I can't tell you whether the next decade is going to look like the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, or something even different than anything we've seen in the past. And we've seen some bear markets this year at, in the fixed income arena that are different than what you've seen in the past for all of us. It's important to know, particularly and teach young people, there has never been a permanent bear market. I can tell you all sorts of ways to create a permanent bear market and lose 20% of your money, 30% of your money for life and not ever be able to get it back. Those are the bear markets I'd be concerned about personally. Those bear markets might be things like, uh, well, uh, buying a load fund and losing one half of 1% for the rest of your life on your equity investments. It might be investing in a mutual fund that has high expenses and paying an extra 1% a year for the higher expenses of the mutual fund rather than being in an index fund at one-tenth of 1%. That is being in an actively managed fund in a taxable account where if you know how to read Morningstar, you'll find out that you're going to lose about 1% a year based on the taxes you pay if you're in the upper rates of taxes, not the lower rates of taxes. But there's about a 1% difference between the after-tax return of actively managed funds and index funds. Those all turn into bear markets, but they don't come back. The beauty of dealing with the bear markets that we get all upset about. And I know, you know some of you get really upset. If you leave a light on in the room after you leave, you get upset because there's waste here. So it doesn't surprise me that we, the bear market that takes 30 or 40 or 50% of our money is unsettling, but it has always come back, including in Japan. It just sometimes takes longer than others. Go ahead and click. Just click it, huh? And then hit continue. This, I don't want it to keep popping up. It's okay. He did way more important things when he worked with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, we also have to be on the alert. There are two people here this morning who have mentioned things about sharing uh, the book that you're getting free, that we're talking millions with young people. It is such a bonus to be able to have an opportunity when you're young to put money into a bear market. If you put money into the market in 1932, 33, uh, 30 and 31, all four of those years. 40 years later, those four years' results would have led you to, for a $1,000 investment, a total of over $250,000 on 4000 because you start. The same thing happened in 73, 74. If you put money in in 73 and 74 and you were just getting started, 40 years later, you got more. That, well, it's also over 250000 
And the, ba the, biggest, the, the biggest risk in a bear market is how you respond to it. If you let it destroy and, or, or, or trigger what I call the I can't stand it anymore market <laughs> timing strategy, ICSIA, you are likely going to turn that move that you make, your response, into something bad rather than something good. And yet, I know when you do it and you have that money in a money market account and it's not going anywhere up or down and every time the, the market is down in the next week, you're thinking, oh, thank God I'm in a money market fund. And it feels good for the short term. It's like, a, it's like taking drugs, I suspect. You feel good short term, but the long term impact can be really bad. And the good thing is it's easy to manage the risk. It's so easy to manage the risk. You can actually eliminate it. You can eliminate it uh, e easily by simply going to cash for the rest of your life or going to bonds for the rest of your life. Of course, now this year we're thinking, well, maybe that's not the right thing to do either. But if you're going to do it right in terms of as an investor, I think the key is, and I think Tom would agree with this, and I'm sorry for the small print on this table. It's in your handout. It's in your handout. Now that's the kind of stuff he did for me. That's important. It is in your handout. But, but, but I will tell you what, this is an example of the kind of work that we do. We have almost 200 different tables for people to, to learn from on our website. It won't surprise you that engineers and other people out of the STEM disciplines tend to be the people who like all these tables, but not the average person. I find them really entertaining and exciting because what I have for you on this table is something you can learn so much from because on this table we go back to 1970 and we show you the return of the S&P 500 under the column that says 100% stocks on the right hand side right next to the S&P 500 without any expenses. We built some expenses in there that would reflect today's expenses. So you can see year by year, how would you have done with that S&P 500 index? On the other side of that page, we have 100% in bonds. So now you can put together how much in bonds and how much in stocks. And then you can learn, and here gets bigger here so it's easier to read, but here's where you can, re, you can learn what the long-term impact is of combining how much in fixed income, how much in stocks. If we looked at the 100% equity portfolio, we can see right there that it compound, the annualized return was 11% over the last 52 years through the end of 21. But we can see a representative, represented kind of a, a way of thinking about losing money towards the bottom of the page where we show you the worst three months, the worst six months, the worst 12, the worst, what, 36 and the worst 60. Those are the kind of things you might have to go through in order to survive a bear markets or down markets over a long period of time. And I think we should take it seriously. I know at 79, my wife and I are 50-50 stocks and bonds. We have decided we are willing to lose, what does it say here, 50-50, the worst year is a loss of 23.2%. And I wouldn't be shocked if it were 25. But we've taken it on contractually in a way because we see this and we assume the future could be similar. So these tables are built to give you a sense of the process. I'm almost done. I have no idea. I'm not going anywhere. Really? Okay. I got to wait for the other guy who talks more than me on the other show too. So oh, that's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. See what I mean? Every comment has a response. It's great. On D1.4, this is putting the S&P 500 and all those different combinations to work for you in retirement, starting with a million dollars and taking out 
44% of that million dollars and increasing it every year by the amount of inflation over that 52 year period. Again, we can see the bad stuff. We can see where you started out with a million, but by the time that you got down to 73 and 74, you were behind. You were taking money out, but your principal, part of it was gone. You can also see, by the way, what you'd have at the end of the period of time. You can look out 30 years. You can look out 40 years. How much would I have left for others had I lived through that experience? And some of the time the market was great, sometimes it was terrible. And that's the way it's going to be in the future. But here's the thing that's interesting. Oh, got it again, Tom. Here's the thing that is interesting. When you go to that next page, which it reflects, thank you, reflects one decision on your part as a family or individual. Instead of taking out 40,000, one way you can protect yourself against bear markets is take out 30,000 so that when the bar, bear market is taking money away and then you're having to live off of the money that you were getting out of that portfolio by taking out three or 30,000 instead, th instead of 40, it may not sound like a big deal, but if you look at the bottom line numbers, you will see the amount of money you had left that you defended against losing by taking out less. We know this intuitively, that's the way it would be. Here's an example of how it actually looks. And to the extent that you like this kind of information, we got over, a, I think about, about 80 tables that are just about distributions for people who want to test. And, and, and one more thing, we now have an investment calculator where you can put your own numbers in and crank out the results rather than numbers we make up. And now, you got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. So those are a lot of numbers, by the way, um, in case you didn't know. Paul's very comfortable with that. And what I find in practice for most of our clients is this is a year-by-year decision. How, how do you, when you do your distributions, do you look at the balance at the end of each year and decide what you're taking or on a personal level? Exactly. It's all on a formula. The first week of each year, we take out 5% of the value of the portfolio uh, that what it, what it was worth on 1231. There you go. And you still have money left? Yes. <laughs> okay. I, by the way, I'm here I didn't know how many donuts you might try to well, steal. Well, I wasn't worried second. about that. My, my wife could be out shop. No, I can't say that. <laughs> no, don't say That's that. That's totally inappropriate. Don't, don't, don't say that. She All right. <laughs> so I, this is a fascinating topic that we decided to put in here because it, this is the number one call we get to our program called Talking Real Money, which will begin airing in a few hours uh, live, uh, for those of you who do not listen, uh, on AM 1000, FM 97.7 at noon today, Northwest News Radio. The number one call is, I just came into money, what do I do? It's, not, it, 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 it's either an inheritance, I sold something, et cetera. And of course, what do people want to do today? Nothing, because the market's down. Now you just heard Paul mention the fact that buying when markets go down is a good idea. Interestingly enough, I read a piece from Charles Schwab last night around this, which I think you'll find interesting as well, Paul. They had some fascinating numbers. Uh, for people that, this is for young people, put in $2,000 a year for 20 years and invest in a, a globally diversified portfolio. If you invest it as you get the money, after those 20 years, you have $162,000. If you invest at the highest point each year, in other words, the market goes up, you put it at the highest point, you have $141,000 at the end of the 20 years. If you stay in cash, if you just take the two leave it in the bank, instead of the $162,000, you have $64,000. Mm. So it's, it's a huge decision. And today, sadly, as far as I'm concerned, it's about $18 trillion of your dollars, because you probably have some of it there too, that is in banks, savings and loans, places like that. So I, I decided yesterday to look at the numbers, because the first time in many, many years, you can actually make something on your cash. Uh, and out of curiosity, how many of you ran out and bought I-bonds in the last year because they were paying 9.6%? A few hands, terrific. 
And as you may know, the I bond rate now is, do you know this? You know, six something. 6.8%, which is still pretty generous. And for those of you who've been regular listeners to the podcast and radio show, you know I have not been a huge fan because I find them to be kind of a gimmick. The interest rate is relatively short term. It is technically a 30 year bond that, that you're buying, and you have to hold them, I think, three years at least to get the, the interest from that higher rate. So I'm not a huge fan. Oh, and of course, it's on $10,000 maximum, and you have to do it on their website, which crashes anytime they get more than about four people on there. <laughs> so it's a bit of a problem. Um, but if you take your money to the Bank of America, does anybody know what they're paying on the savings accounts there today? 0.01. So, and it's, uh, many of the trillions of dollars are there. Instead, if you went online, and you could do this yourself, we go to bank rate on a regular basis just to see what people are paying you for your cash or cash holdings. At bank rate, you'll see that uh, a high yield savings account, I use one, and by the way, you have to be comfortable with the fact that this is all online. There is no bricks and mortar. There's no place to go into to see somebody there and make sure your money's okay. So you have to trust the internet in a way. But at Basque Bank right now, with no minimum and no duration, you can get 3.6% in a high yield savings account. Capital One, you may have heard of them. You can get 3%, which is pretty decent. Again, considering the cash paid nothing until very, very recently. CDs, how about, this make you feel good, Paul. How about a one year CD, you can get a Capital One now at 4%. Uh, there's some brokered CDs at Wells Fargo that you can buy through Schwab for four and a half percent. Don't trust Capital One, Marcus, I guess it's operated by Goldman Sachs, you can get 3.6%. You get the idea here that cash now is paying something. And uh, you need to be a bit nimble and pay, and pay close attention to it. Paul mentioned money market funds, Vanguard's money market fund. I'm not a fan of money market funds in general, by the way, but Vanguard's money market fund, which is VMFXX, paying 2.9% right now. So again, some of these things that we sort of ignored for a long period of time because they weren't paying anything at all, if you ha insist on having money in cash, you should at least be efficient enough to move it to one of these places where you're getting something. Because the people that are making money on that $18 trillion, while you're not, are the banks. And that's one of my big arguments, is again, be more efficient with your cash. Do you have a lot, do you keep a lot of cash? I mean, other than in the bank, I mean, in the, uh, in the back room, in the, in the safe? In the back room. The back room. Yep, and we leave the back door unlocked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know where you live, too. By, by the way, way that, so. that Vanguard fund that you quoted, yes. I think, is a federal. I think you're right. Uh, so yep. that's one of the reasons it's lower. So, and, and, but, so let's talk about uh, places also for short-term cash. Now, there was a, a bond fund that Paul told me about 25 years ago, and uh, it's the Vanguard Short-Term Corporate Bond Fund, VFSTX, VFSTX. Interestingly enough, today it's yielding, uh, fascinatingly enough, 5.1%. That's the good news. The bad news is prior to this year, it had one losing quarter, one losing quarter. This year, it's already had three losing quarters, and it's down 7.9%. Now, this is a fund that holds short-term bonds from corporations that are likely to pay them back. Places like Microsoft, right? Big corporations. But there's a, a very good yield. Um, I looked at a couple of other funds, again, for more of uh, your cash needs. The Vanguard Total Bond Fund, which you can own as an exchange-traded fund, BND, is now yielding 44 That's the good news. The bad news is, and we'll spend a little time uh, on fixed income in a moment, it has lost uh, this year to date, 15.8 percent. 15 point doesn't sound very bond-like, does mm -hmm. it? When you see those those losses. So again, there's more options here. And what I try to tell people that come into our office, and I have $200,000, but I'm waiting for something to happen, is at least be efficient enough to get something on it while you're waiting. And by the way, we had somebody call last week and say they're waiting for the outcome of the election. And I said, well, if you're worried about the election, then how about the war in Ukraine? How about inflation? How about it? There's all kinds of other things I think that will be more impactful to the market. And probably, by the way, and some of you know this, the prices of securities are already baked into uh, them today. The, the election that, uh, that appears to be a split decision um, is already baked into those prices. So cashing in on cash, again, I bring this up because I see a lot of people making mistakes and, and not taking advantage of the opportunities there. And then there's this other part that Paul mentioned has been very troubling this year because in a general sense, 
when stocks decline the way they have this year, bonds are the sort of the base for your portfolio, right? They're the ballast, they're the thing sort of keeping in place while stocks are going up and down. And when I talk about bonds, I always want to go back to the kind of the, the basics because people sometimes get confused about what kind of security a bond is. Remember, a stock is an investment in a company. And some days, the future looks great for the company formerly known as FaceTime, Facebook, pardon me, right? And then it becomes Meta or Meta, and it's down 70% year to date. And sometimes Microsoft looks great, and sometimes it doesn't. So in, individual companies, which neither of us uh, invest in, but companies are riskier. You're simply exposing your money to those firms. Bonds have more of a guaranteed nature to them because a bond is like an IOU, right? And by the way, I did pay you back, right? I couldn't mm -hmm. remember. Oh, dang mm -hmm. it, okay. After. Uh, we'll talk after. We'll talk after. So there's a piece of paper, right, that has an interest rate and a stated date of returning of your capital. That is completely different type of security than a stock. So you need to consider that. The trouble this year has been, we've had this, I put, thousand year flood. Um, this very unusual circumstance where stocks and bonds have declined. The Federal Reserve, as you know, as I believe has raised rates six times this year, probably going to have a seventh in November, which will have a negative impact on your fixed income as well. Um, Can I interject yeah, something please. right there, Tom? You know, this is one of the tricky parts. You need to of get up the, so they can see you on, oh, the, well, on the interweb. Uh, the, 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 the tricky part about assuming that if they raise rates again, that bonds will go down. They might not, because bonds could right now be priced with the assumption that that is going to happen, so that when it happens, you may be surprised to find out that the market goes, bond market goes up rather than down. We really don't know how much of that is already figured in kind of the efficient market aspect of stocks and bonds. It's a good point. There isn't necessarily an increase coming with, or a decrease in price based on that. But those two things have been tied together and we've seen it a great this year. But what people always want to know is, okay, if I'm going to have something in bonds, and I think Paul's recommended anyone under the age of 30 has zero percent in bonds, I believe is what mm -hmm. he told me once, mm -hmm. which is, I think, smart and not so smart because we know that people have a tendency to react emotionally to their money even when they're in their 20s and let's say they've been investing in their 401k and all they've seen it go down, 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 why am I doing that? And we've seen young people move from all in stocks to all in bonds. So sometimes it still makes balance for reasons of keeping you on, on the course. But well, how do you build the bond portfolio? Now remember the things that have gotten beaten up the most this year and again, I looked at this number yesterday. For example, the Vanguard long-term federal or, or U.S. government bond fund is down 32.6% year to date. So it's really, you get further out there in terms of maturity, you've taken a much bigger hit than instead, again, building the portfolio, we would prefer to see short and intermediate term duration, how long the bonds are, we would only use bond funds or bond exchange traded funds. And then we would use high quality, um, ignoring things like high yield bond funds, ignoring things that have a, a high risk to them. Because again, even though they've gotten beaten up this year, the bond part of your portfolio should be the safe part of your portfolio. Um, and I was going to ask you, Paul, can you get up again or want me to pull you up? No, kidding. Uh, look at this. Oh, no, it didn't work. <laughs> So in your bond portfolio, you, yes. I think you, we always had the, the ratio. Some Give tips. Me, yeah. 20% in tips. That's right. Short-term tips. 30% in short-term, and these are all government, and 50% uh, in intermediate. You want to say that uh, again? 50% in intermediate, 30% in short-term, and 20% in short-term tips. You can buy longer-term tips or shorter-term tips. They're less risky. The idea is, it's not, for, it's not to create income, it's to create stability. And it did what it was supposed to do this year. I mean, it, it, it isn't pretty, but just as if we're doing a diversified portfolio of equity, if because of the, of the kind you've chosen, you lose less, because it's good to lose less in the bad times 
because it prepares you to make more for the good times. Is so we, we both basically are short to intermediate stay, in our stay up because I'm going to let you take over. Oh, here. Okay. so you're you're back up again. Oh, I I, I do. I already moved on to uh, the next segment here. So and maybe at the end of the day we can spend a couple more minutes talking about bonds because it is a question that's come up quite a bit this year with these sort of you have to say rather dramatic and unexpected in many ways declines that people were not used to. In fact, you have to go back to about the mid. 1990s to see similar type of type of moves. Um, I personally and the people that I talk to believe that what we're seeing is this with this shift to uh, higher interest rates that will get back to a more normal bond market in the long haul where those fixed income payouts will be more like four to five percent providing the stability while stocks are moving up and down. It's, but the, the pain of that birth has been a lot to take in, in one year. So Perfect. come on back over okay. here. So thank you, boss. Paul is going to talk for a couple of minutes about uh, hiring advisor, getting, getting good advice, all that kind of thing. So go ahead, and, sir. And I'll just tag one more thing about the bonds. It is amazing to me how when things are down, we, we go into this mental state where it's a bad thing they're down. It's a great thing that bonds are down right now. I mean, it, it, what is, is, but now that it is, when you t think of the terms of the returns that Tom was just talking about, how does that feel as a retiree to know that you could put money into some fixed income instruments that you might get 4% a year? Anybody like that? And yet, what we hear is, don't buy bonds. Because again, if you, if, if you followed the history, and this is the beauty of, of tracking the history, if you go back to 2010, the, the, the experts were saying, don't invest in anything but a money market or something very, very short because interest rates are gonna skyrocket. We've heard that every year since 2010. Mm -hmm. So people who stayed, and a lot of people did, in money market funds, they may be making more right now, but they waited a long time to get the payoff. So, uh, The same people that told you not to be in stocks because the next bear market is coming. The that's exactly advice. it. Yeah. Exactly it. This is the most popular free book we've ever had. I have no idea how many it sold on Amazon. I mean, it still sells. It's, it's still available free on our website. Get smarter, get screwed. How to select the best and get the most out of your financial advisor. Um, I will just warn you, I'm not kind. When I say I'm not kind, I have nice, good, honest, dear friends who are in the brokerage industry. So this is not like I'm picking on any individual, but there are 80 reasons in that book you should not deal with somebody who charges a commission. There are so many reasons, so many ways it can get you in trouble. And they can even be doing what they're doing in their heart. It's the best thing I know to do. It may be the best thing to know to do, but it's the wrong thing for the client. And so if you read 10 of those and you say, yeah, I got it, you don't have to read the next 70. But you'll be amazed how many different ways you can, uh, I won't call it, be taken advantage of, but that it's going to hurt rather than help. I put this in. I think you also put it in, in, in your... I just wanted to, to show this advisor interview form that they use at Vestory. And it's in, their, it's in the handout. Oh, it's in the handout. And the people at home, they have it yep. in their mm -hmm. handout. Yep. You know, the, the, the question is, if you know you're going to go through this process, I don't care whether it's at Vestry or any other firm in the business, these are things that should be part of the process in thinking through the decision, uh, what, what you uh, are, are wanting to know. Also, you all got a free copy today of Financial Fitness Forever, a book that was written because I was doing a special for PBS back in 2012 or 2011. And uh, chapter 10, which is also free on our website, but chapter 10 is about 12 numbers you should know. 
if you're going to, to, to put together your plan, and, and uh, I will talk a little bit later about the plan, but I think this kind of a form kind of sets you up to do the right thing. And before you go there, so I, I think this is a good, interesting spot. Um, I just heard yesterday in a podcast, it's 1% of America that uses a financial advisor. It's a very small number, a tiny, wow. tiny, tiny number. But Does that include enough, brokers? I don't know about that, but I just yeah. that's a number I heard yesterday. But you're a guy who's been in the business, I think you mentioned something like 40 years, something like that. Do you have an advisor? I do. How come? I do because uh, I love what I do, teaching and writing and doing all those things to help others. The last thing I want to do in retirement is worry about my money. I, I, and, but, but what I know is, I know exactly what that advisor believes. I know, when, when I say I know exactly what they're doing, I don't get involved in worrying about the, 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 the conditions under which we will do any tax loss harvesting or rebalancing. It's just not, I don't want that to be part of my life. When I retired, I told my wife, I guarantee I will never work for money again. And by golly, when you manage your own money, you're working. Now, I'm trying to teach people ways to manage your own money that you're not working. But a lot of people, it's a, it's, you get consumed by it. I had a hot of curiosity. How many of you watch CNBC? And don't hesitate, to be honest. Well, not, oh, here they come. <laughs> but about five of you, I guess. And, and I watch it first thing in the morning. I get up between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning and get to work. And, uh, or I get to writing or whatever I'm doing that I'm enjoying. But, but I turn on CNBC just to see the state of the world. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gone. I, do ne I never watch Kramer except in the ads I have to see. But, and, and by the way, I have met Jim Kramer down in San Miguel de Allende once. And he's just such a nice kind of a teddy bear kind of guy, very humble in, in person, which really surprised me. Uh, but but uh, that doesn't change how I feel about his work. Yes, sir. You're saying uh, people can take on different personas when they're in the media, is what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, just, just a question, just one. <laughs> Just but asking. I know you use the same kind of humor on <laughs> air as you do off air. L or lack thereof. And a yes. lot of air. <laughs> so we have to determine if the people are working for us or the house. Remember, when you work for a firm that is answering to shareholders, you have a fiduciary. I'm talking about brokers have a bigger fiduciary responsibility to the firm than they do to their clients. And also, they can, if they wish to, be both a investment advisor registered and be working without conflicts of interest, or they can put another hat on and start charging commissions and doing it on a suitability. To, to do what is not in your best interest, but it's okay. When you are doing, working on the basis of suitability, if you're talking to a 98-year-old person who needs income and is in a high tax bracket, or maybe not even a high tax bracket, but they like the idea of not paying taxes, they love that idea, you can put them in a mutual fund with a high load, with high tax, that would not be tax exempt, but if it happened to be in an equity portfolio where the taxes are much higher in actively managed funds, you can do all these things that are step by step hurting that person in the long run. And it's okay. Oh, I forgot to talk about the load. And get a 5% load off the top. All of that is okay. It's suitable. By the way, if it were not suitable, the SEC would have to say that it's illegal to offer those, those shares for sale. So you really need to know that the person working for you is on your side. And you actually, you know that by what they're doing if you've had the education to know what is already in your best interest. I know what's in my best interest, but I'm using an advisor 
even after knowing that, because I don't want to be involved in the process. I want somebody else to do it. But I still know what they're doing, and I think you should know what you're doing, or what they're doing. And then you have to know how to measure their advice. By the way, this is really tricky business. I don't know any more difficult situation than maybe what a doctor has to face than being an investment advisor and doing a good job. Because every client has a different set of emotional feelings about the process. In most cases, and the most fun cases, it's a couple, and one is conservative, and one is more aggressive, one is afraid of the market, the other thinks they rule the market. And you have to figure out how to serve that client, that couple, properly and find, mediate. You know, in, 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 in an age when everybody's at war with each other, I don't know honestly whether it is more difficult today than it was when I was in the business. Is it more difficult today? No, no. I think it's the same. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. And that, that couple or that person is going to have a different series of events go through their life that you have to counsel them on. Because the bottom line is your investment advisor, financial advisor, does not make you money in the market. The market makes you money. They cannot control the market. They can't do anything to make the market act in your best, in your best interest. They hope it will. They have history on their side that says that it will. But let's not fool ourselves. None of us can either cause the market to go up or down, nor can we know what it's going to do. Because from 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500 had a worse return than from 19, 1929 to 1938. A lower return. And people used to used to make fun of me for going back and showing people what happened back then and to be prepared for that. And they say, that, that information does not have any meaning. That happened too long ago to be meaningful. It's just the nature of markets. And for example, most of us, what happens to us not only happens because like you get good advice from advisors, you invest and then the market cooperates. My wife and I bought a house in San Miguel de Allende about 16 years ago. We bought it at the peak of the market. But even after putting some money in, we were able to double the return on our investment. We were really lucky. Uh, well, that's part of the story. The rest of the story is we were really unlucky because the people who said we doubled our return, that was the Mexican government. How did they determine that? Because the deed, the way they do it in Mexico, the transaction, even though we made the purchase in the United States, the, the transaction is in pesos. And between then and today, the peso had gone from 10 to a, to a dollar to 20, and we had struck it rich. So we had to pay in Mexico a capital gains tax, even though we didn't make a dime. In fact, we legitimately lost money. Was we, were we lucky? But that's part of our story. And an advisor would, is going to know this story if you're working with an advisor at least the way that I think you should be working with an advisor. Please. Keeps me employed. <laughs> and of course, um, advice in your best interest. Uh, again, it's about who he or she is working for. And you should believe that in everything they do, if there were a list of mistakes that you could make, and I can name them easily 30 of them, you need to know that that advisor is in fact picking that fork in the road that is in your best interest. And if they're not, you need to know why. 
because they may believe, well, I believe you can pick individual stocks, and that's just fine. And I believe because in 1966, when I went into the industry, if you held 10, 10 to 20 stocks, that was considered to be great diversification. Then by 1999, people concluded great diversification came if you bought 500 companies, not 10 or 20. They said you should put it all in the S&P 500. There are still people who say that. What they are ignoring is that the S&P 500 is a particular asset class. And there are other asset classes, and I know that Vestry uses them, I know that Merriman uses them, I know that they're in my, in my portfolio. There are other investment asset classes that sometimes do well when the S&P 500 is doing poorly. And sometimes the S&P 500 is doing well when most of them are doing poorly. But over time, the ride is so much easier when you have the proper diversification. Now I think actually, this, me. this looks, this is the really boring stuff. <laughs> Can somebody help him with the chair right outside the door? Oh, I should ask Tom. Uh, Tom, do you have an investment advisor? I do. I do. He's very good, by the way. And I like what you said about, uh, about retirement. So I'm, I, I, have to th I still have to think about what I'm going to do. I have a list of things, actually, that I want to do. But managing my money wouldn't be one of them. So helping others would be. Um, so I wanted to take a couple minutes and talk about, in addition, oh, by the way, I was supposed to mention earlier, that for people that are watching online and you want help, I think they gave you a little uh, a website you can go to, TalkingRealMoney.com, you click on uh, Meet an Advisor, or I'm supposed to mention our phone number as well, 800-386-3004, 800-386-3004, and ask for Tom. That's what they told me to say, right? Okay, so don't call late, I go to bed early. Um, so, okay, here's the thing about retirement income. Most of you, when you meet with us, say, do I have enough money? Is it going to work? Am I going to be able to continue to take 5% out of my portfolio? How's this all going to work? And that question I find fascinating because that usually should be at the end of the conversation after you've worked on all the other parts of things you've got to know before you can put together a plan. And the toughest one is the one at the beginning. Paul alluded to the fact that, that he doesn't, doesn't sound like you really have a budget per se. You, so you get a certain amount of money and that's what you spend. By the way, it works that way in my house. <laughs> there's what, it, uh, everything I make is ours, everything that she makes is her, anyway, there's a whole other thing, but <laughs> we find most of you have no idea how much money you're spending, or you think you're spending less than you are, or you've, uh, you know, your household brings in $300,000 a year and you sit down with us and tell us, well, our, let's say our cost of living is $100,000. And I say, you're either paying very high taxes or you're the greatest saver we've ever met. Because it turns out most of us are in denial about how much money is going out. So the first part of retirement income is being honest with yourself, with your advisor, or if you're doing this on your own, putting it on paper in a way. And here's the way I do it. We, when we do this with planning software, and it's very elaborate, and the software is fantastic, but to get to how much you're actually spending, and we have different categories, whether it's housing or all, that all goes in. But here's the way I look at it when I just sit down with you. I will ask you today what sources of income you have. I will ask you how much money is going to pay taxes. I will ask you how much you are saving. Everything else you're spending. That's really it. And most people want to get in an argument about, no, no, it's, that's way how much I forgot I had to take the dog to do that, or soccer required, all those other sort of things that people just put out of their minds. So knowing how much you're spending, that has got to be the beginning of any conversation before you get to whether or not your money will last. And then this part about all of the sources. We have a tendency oftentimes to forget all the things that could be helpful to our retirement income. And I start with Social Security because it, in today's world, the number one question we get about Social Security is, will it still be there for me? Will it look different? And when do I take it? When do I trigger? We know that almost half of us, all of us, take Social Security at age 62. Many people take it while still working. 
not realizing they're paying a lot of taxes on that as well. And here's something to think about. Here's an easy number to remember. After you reach full retirement age, which for me will be close to 67, still a few years down the road, my Social Security benefit will increase 8% a year plus inflation. 8% a year. Now, is there anything he guaranteed you that's 8% a year? Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can guarantee you that's 8% a year. And yet most people, it's only 6% of Americans today, wait until age 70 to take Social Security. And they don't think about the other person in their lives as well. Because in my case, I've been a bigger earner than my wife. It's harder to make money selling pizza than it is helping people with their financial situation. And boy, after yesterday, I can tell you that's true. But anyway, so in my case, it really is going to make a lot of sense to wait until age 70 to take it. She will, after I leave here, which would be expected to be before she did, she will be able to either have her benefit or my benefit. One, so the numbers make sense. Now, here's the bad news. You got to live the 10 years after you take Social Security, right? Because the numbers, they, they do not work if you don't take it until 70 and then you die at 72. You're going to call me up and be angry. And please don't use the number I mentioned earlier. <laughs> It's overlooked, it's, it's underappreciated is the way I'd put it. Again, with only about 5% of Americans waiting until age 70 to take it. And the only two circumstances I can really see taking it prior to that is if you really have to have the money or you know in your family you don't, aren't going to live till age 80. Well, then that, I can understand that. Those circumstances are fine. By the way, another one to think about, and this come up recently, is around pensions, and you've seen some of the situations here with interest rates up about whether or not you should take an annuity payout or take the lump sum. Again, something that I don't think gets the attention that it deserves uh, around which one to take, when to trigger, all those sorts of things. People have a tendency to, to uh, just go ahead and say, oh, you know, I'm 65, I want my pension. Then you can go back to the question that you all want to know the answer to is, will my savings last? Now, Paul just showed you, I think we still have these here, he showed you a couple of different examples as to withdrawals from your portfolio and whether or not your portfolio survives. He shows it for 50 plus years. Now, I, I, he takes care of himself, but I don't think I'm gonna have a 50 year retirement. You may have one, God uh -huh. bless you, I hope so. Could be. But the reality is it won't be. It'll be more like 20 to 30 years. And the reality is, again, this is something that we know working with clients, we have about 800 clients in every state, um, is that you need to be willing to be flexible. Flexible withdrawals. Paul mentioned his 5%. Sometimes things come up. I want to buy a house in Mexico is poor advice that, no, I'm kidding. But the, the <laughs> things come along, right? And you have to be willing to take more or less. Maybe you take, uh, in a good year of stock market return, you take everybody to go to Hawaii. And then the next year is 2022, and you take everybody and you go to Wild Waves. Um, and don't do it in November. The point is, for most of these type of planning situations, you need to be willing to have some flexibility around line one so that it will continue to work until the end. Uh, to, that you'll have the income that you need all the way through. Again, the work that we do for our clients, the work that we do free for many people is to look at all these things to make sure you're doing everything to pull as best you can for your retirement, for your retirement income. I don't want to go too long here, Paul, because I think this next oh. one, this next one is yours. I do want to mention that uh, we're still hoping to be done by, it looks pretty good, around 10.30. Yeah. We will stay for questions. We'll stay online for questions. I think those have been coming in by chat. So if you have something along the way that you want to ask, go ahead and ask it. Justin's sitting in the back. He will take those, and then we will do them. And then here with our audience uh, as well, we'll take those questions. So without further ado, you're back up, sir. All right. By the way, um, we, we, we all have trouble controlling our minds. You can't, you can't stop. Our mind's going to do what it's going to do. And he used the word trigger, I think, three times. Claim. Pardon? I should have used claim instead. Well, no, what my problem was, first of all, I thought of a gun. <laughs> Secondly, I thought of a horse. <laughs> and, and the third thing, I thought about when it starts. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know, good point. Words have an impact mm -hmm. on us, and uh, and I find always find it interesting how uh, how they can change our lives. I would make one comment. One of the most important, from my viewpoint, having been around the industry for a long time, and having started for three years as a stockbroker and seeing that side of the business. Probably one of the most interesting aspects of income in retirement that I have concluded uh, that is a, a, a challenge to young people is that if you can save and have more than enough, you know, John Bogle made a really big deal about people having enough and he was serious about it. His work was to help people have enough so they could retire with dignity. He wasn't worried about making anybody more than enough. I am interested in helping people have more than enough. I know that uh, in, in essence, Tom's firm is that way too, because if you have more than enough, you can use a higher payout and having that higher payout means if you're a giver, you give more, whether it's to family or charities. If you're a traveler, you can travel more. The reason my wife and I can take out 5%, and we have tables to show this, and feel like we can just be as aggressive as we want in taking five instead of four, which people say that's the number is four, is because we saved enough that we knew that we had would have more than we needed. And I think that as a goal for a young person, by the way, the other reason that goal for a young person should have more than enough, because enough is not enough, is that in our lives, things just don't work out the way you thought they were. I thought I would have accomplished certain things by the time I was 30, I didn't. I thought I'd be one, married to one person for the rest of my life. And I didn't. I wasn't. I thought a whole bunch of things that never happened. It is difficult to tell the difference between the courtship, the honeymoon, and the reality. But the reality of life is we have stumbles. I just this morning got an email from a person I've never met him personally, but Chris emailed to tell me it looks like he has uh, bladder cancer and to pray for him and he's not very old I think he's in his 50s uh, this is not what he planned and so I really work hard to try to get young people now I am this weekend aside from doing this which is just golden for me I love doing this I know Tom does too but I am going to be sitting with a newborn child. She was born Wednesday. And uh, it's amazing how pretty they can be when they're, when, when they're yours. <laughs> but our first uh, granddaughter. And uh, she's going to meet with me. And we're going to be talking about what we're doing for her today for the rest of her life. Now, hopefully I can get her parents to sit with me while I talk to her. <laughs> because I will write the check then. Because I know the earlier we get started, the higher the probabilities of success. We all know that, but we put off doing so many things because we're going to get around to it later. But the payoff comes from when we do it early, especially for people who don't understand the process. Because when you don't understand the process, it's real easy to be, uh, be, be afraid of the process. Be afraid, by the way, that you're going to make mistakes. And uh, You want to tell them what you're doing, the, the money you're giving, how you're doing it? Oh, sure. Uh, the purpose of the money is going to be to fund a Roth IRA for as long as it will fund a Roth IRA. It will be enough that if the investment produces a similar return to what it has produced in the past, 
to fund her IRA if she doesn't start funding it until 18 or 21, to fund her Roth IRA for the rest of her life. Now, that's a dream because uh, I don't know what the market will do. I do know, for example, the S&P 500 since 2000 has compounded at about 7% or less a year since 2000. This is the asset class that's supposed to compound at 10%. It is way behind where it's supposed to be. So I know that's a possibility for this wonderful young lady. And, uh, but if it does, and, and, and the way that we're doing it, it's both emotional and it, and it is also, I think, uh, uh, it, it, it diversifies in a way that is very special. Those of you that follow our work know that I'm very high on small cap value. If you follow Tom's work, you would find they believe in small cap value for part of the portfolio. We also believe in the S&P 500 because it's the highest quality equity asset class we have. Now some people may say some sort of a dividend paying, paying portfolio would be higher class, I don't know, but I think most academics agree that is the blue ribbon equity asset class. And it's the benchmark that most of us are, in essence, competing with. And the beauty is, if you look at our studies, what happens if you combine small cap value with the S&P 500? It's fascinating because you actually have, over the last 52 years, you lose less. If you add up all the losing years, you lose less in the combination of the two than you do in the S&P 500. In fact, you lose less if you put all your money in the small cap value. And the reason I will not put it all in the small cap value is because human nature would lead her to become discouraged when for 15 or 20 years, small cap value is underperforming the S&P 500. But she will have the S&P 500. And she will not know anything about this until she is either 18 or 21 years old. So when the, when the account is opened, we will see how the S&P 500 did and how small cap value did and how the combination did. She will have a real education with her money right there. And. The things that stand in the way. The market, I have no worry about the market. I mean, we all may be dust by then, okay? So I don't worry about that. But I do worry about the behavior. Because my daughter and her husband are going to have to do the right things mm -hmm. with the money. For my other grandchildren, I set up crumb, what are called crummy trusts which keeps their hands off it until they're 65. But as I thought about it, to be able to have that money compounding in a Roth IRA until she's 65, wow, until she's 95, until she dies. And children being born today, there's, the odds are, and the more money you have, the more likely this is you're going to live to be greater than 100. So this is going to be meaningful money for the rest of, of her life. And uh, you can see year by year how that combination would have done for the last 52 years. You didn't know you were going to open up that Pandora's <laughs> box. <laughs> and we all worry about mistakes. Every time, I grew up in an environment of uh, if, if, if you did something wrong, it had to be a serious wrong thing, uh, smaller wrong things weren't so bad as serious wrong things, but you could get a severe spanking. And as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't even know that he was my uh, stepfather when, when I was young. And, uh, uh, and he had this thing that he would spank you until you quit crying. Now that makes you tough you also become very sensitive to how other people feel. And by that, and, and I think that's good. I think it helped make me a really, a better salesperson, a better teacher, a better a lot of things. But I can tell you this, 
There's nothing that scares me more personally than making a mistake. Any mistake I make becomes uh, a, a reliving of the punishment. You, this is, I'm not the only one in this room that has this problem. And there are people in this room that, that, that will, will focus on, like I mentioned earlier, turning the lights off because we're, you know, we're frugal here in this household. Let's act like it. We don't like to make mistakes. And yet the industry thrives off of your mistakes. They do. If you don't make mistakes, Wall Street makes a ton of money. So there is uh, in here somewhere, oh, and I love this quote from Warren Buffett. He said, to be a success, you only have to do a very few things right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. And when I talk to the engineering students at Rutgers next week, I'm going to take them up to 30 different forks in the road that they're going to take either by design or by default. And I want them to do it the right way. What about those of us who follow Jimmy Buffett more than Warren Buffett? <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> oh, Tom. He gets stuck. Oh, Tom. There you go. There is a DVD. You all got a CD, a, a collection of CDs that were recorded for a PBS special. You can go online and you'll be able to get the DVDs from the financial fitness. There's one, How to Avoid the 20 Most Common Mistakes Retirees Make. I love lists. I just love lists. Every time I come to a fork in the road and I know there's a need for a list, I, I write 10 things why, because there's got to be 10 things. Now there's 20. But the big ones, I mean, are, these are some of the big ones. And you can go watch it and listen to it. No plan. Tom has made the case. You've got to know this stuff. It's about, in fact, on that CD that you got, one of those pieces, it's about 40 minutes long, defense, defense, defense. I try to make the case that successful investing is more about defense than it is about offense. Because if you do the things to defend against taxes, defend against expenses, defend against bear markets, all these things will come out of a plan because you'll be forced to go to the forks in the road or something similar to them. Taking too little risk, taking too much risk. I showed you taking out 3% and 4%. All those columns went to the bottom of the page because in every case, whether you were 20% in equities or 50 or 100%, you made it through 52 years. And by the way, I will be here 50 years from now if only in the mind of my granddaughter. <laughs> and hopefully the kids of people we've been teaching. That's my goal. But if I had showed you one more page and showed you the impact of taking out 5% and adjusting for inflation every year, you would have been broke in about 20 years on that table. You would have been a broken a number of relatively short periods of time because you were taking out too much and you were adding for inflation. Remember, when you've oversaved, you ignore inflation. It doesn't matter because you're already taking out more than you really need. Too little risk. There are a lot of people who felt so secure over all the years the way they invested because they didn't take any risk. And now they come to retirement and it's a terrible time emotionally to start deciding, oh, I ought to learn how to invest and take risk that I'll lose money. That just rarely happens mm -hmm. with people who have spent a lifetime being conservative and frugal and all. But both of those, and it's, it's and it isn't that we're looking because we can't know, but we're not looking for the perfect solution, you know, perfect is the enemy or of good enough. What's that saying we were taught? Uh, I can't. 
I, by the way, I have memorized the test that they give to see if you have Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, are you still passing? Are you okay? Or I'm still passing. Okay, checking. My wife's a little damn. <laughs> People spend so much time. This is emotional. And this is a huge mistake. By the way, all the emotions about investing we have that have to do with worry, they will eventually trigger a sell. Mm -hmm. I have seen situations where I've seen people when I was an advisor and they, they talking with them and how they were doing and what they were concerned about, always scared to death of something. Taxes, inflation, the, the, the debt, national debt, who was running the country, and then one, one last time something happens and all that worry comes tumbling down and they say, I'm just gonna put it into this indexed annuity and quit worrying. Or something that they think is taking the, the risk out of their life. And sometimes those are terrible, terrible decisions. And my wife and I have been reading a book on stoicism. They are daily readings about stoicism. And I gotta tell you, it's had an impact on me about the things that I'm worried about. Because it, it teaches me to give better perspective. This is not a religious thing, it's a philosophical thing. I'm curious, how many Stoics do we have here? <laughs> well, if they not put their hand- Not one Stoic! If they, don't, if they put their hand up, then they're not a Stoic then. Right? I'm gonna go back and cancel my membership. <laughs> and here, trust the wrong source of advice. I made this point earlier. I, I made the comment about Wall Street, Main Street, and University Street. The biggest fear that I have is that you will hear somebody on TV make a presentation that makes so much sense. And yes, the whole thing is coming down. Our society is collapsing, the, 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 the capitalism is collapsing, the socialists are taking, whatever it is. And we have equal numbers of people on both sides of these, of these radical positions who are worried about everything collapsing. I've been in this business since 19... Well, I started in 63 investing, and by 65, I was, or 66, I was working for a firm in the industry. And ever since then, I know there has always been a list of, of things that can go wrong and of things that can go right. There's the good news and there's the bad news. And people think the bad news is bad, and people think the good news is good, so when the market is high, they're plenty relaxed and they're joyous about being able to get into the market when it's going up, and they think linearly, so they think it's going up forever. Or at least for long enough for them to make some real money. And then they're gonna get out, they say, because they're really at heart market timers. When in fact, Good times are bad, and bad times are good in this sense. If somebody says, things are terrible, I don't know how they could get any worse. You know that feeling, that is when you're really down. That is the time that the market is probably priced like in 30 and 31 and 32 or 73 and 74 when there actually was the, the front cover of a magazine, maybe U.S. News and World Report. Or death of equities. You, it was Business Week. Business Week in the, uh, on the front. Death, the death of equities. It was all coming down. It was the end of the market in the 70s. Well, obviously, it turned out it wasn't the end of the market. But these feelings we have when things are good and people say they're great and and they all know, by the way, this is one thing I was taught when I went into the brokerage industry in 1966, that we make the most money when the market is doing well, when the market is high, because you cannot get them to do anything when the market is low. And so if you want to make a living, you better get out there and sell today because now is when people will buy. Is that in your best interest? Well, not really. 
but the process of educating people how good it is to invest when the market is low is so difficult because people are afraid. And I think that might be the end of me. That's it? You're going to just collapse right here and that's going to be the end of the whole thing? That's going to be very dramatic. I, I do want to ask I you... I did collapse. No, the, stay right here. This is, this is a good, good point. Um, because what you just said about your background and about how we feel about all these things, it's a fascinating thing to me. Now, because between the two of us, we had very different upbringing, right? I mean, my reinforcement was very positive, I would say. It wasn't very negative. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we just did an uh, online chat with all of our clients a few weeks ago, and somebody at the end said, I hope I'm always as optimistic as Tom is. And, and to invest in stocks, though, requires, it does require you to be optimistic about the future, correct? I mean, you've managed to overcome you, your you, sort of more negative look at things, I think. I, I don't know, know if that negative is the right word. But. I, uh, yes, I mean, I, I got by the, the challenges I had when I was young, in a mm -hmm. sense. There's a good book on optimism, learned optimism, by Dr. Gerald Seligman, I think is his name. And it talks about the impact of, of optimism. And uh, what he says, that people who are optimistic make really good parents. They make good friends. Uh, there's a lot of things that are good about that. Uh, they, I think they tend to be healthier, too, generally. But the one problem with people who, oh, oh, and they make great salespeople. They make great salespeople because people like optimism. But the risk of the optimistic person, and, and this is why it's important for you to get the education, so that when somebody is selling you something that may not be as good as you think it is, as it sounds, but they, they keep banging away at you and you finally say, I get it, sign me up. What they find is, is that people who live and see life through rose-colored glasses, that's what he calls it in the book, rose-colored glasses, are dangerous because they believe the things they say about how great they are, how great the product is, how great whatever it is they're trying to sell. And people who see life through rose-colored glasses, I believe, can convince us to take more risk than we should. Mm -hmm. To buy, in fact, I just heard of a case um, yesterday where uh, I, was, I was talking to a friend advisor and he had a client who was sold a limited partnership in a, uh, a, some sort of a building, a, a real estate deal. And in there, it's just like in a prospectus for a mutual fund, it will say that that mutual fund management does not protect you against market risk. In other words, when the market goes down, expect this fund to go down because they do not go to cash when the market goes down. That would be market timing and they don't believe in market timing. And it says that, it's in there. They do not protect you against what may be the biggest risk of all, market risk. And people sometimes think they're being protected. Or they may say on a limited partnership, they may say there is, there's a risk that you won't be able to find somebody to sell it to if you want to get out of it. Everybody, ever, anybody ever been in one of those? Well, let me just tell you, they are, when you want to get out of it, so does everybody else. And there is no market except from people who are going to offer you next to nothing. So this fellow had invested in something. Uh, and what he didn't read, he didn't read the call factor, the call rights that the people had if things weren't working out and they needed more money. Capital call, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. And that capital call that came, and they, they were assured the, the, the chances of that happening were so, so small. Does that sound like something that might come out of a salesperson's mouth? <laughs> of course it does. And then it happened. And it has, in essence, ruined this guy's 
situation. He's had to cash out a whole bunch of money out of his other long-term accounts that were supporting his life in order to meet this call. So, and I, and I asked this person, I asked this person, would you ever recommend somebody do it themselves? There, he's in the industry. He said, absolutely. He said, if that person will do all the things that a good advisor will do to take care of the account forever. That's one of the reasons I have an advisor. I am not forever. I have a slightly four-year younger wife, but I also have kids and things that, that are meaningful to me and charities. And I want somebody to take care of all of this stuff and to know what my wishes are. So his point is, yes, if you can in fact do all those things, which includes reading the fine print of every product that you put them in if you're advising them. This advisor told me there are some products I read them because some client wants to go in this. I read them and I honestly do not understand them. Which means their client is about to, if they don't take your advice and you say, look at that, I really can't make a judgment because this thing is so confusing. And by the way, the more confusing and difficult a product is to sell, the higher the commission is to sell it. Because the people who want to sell that product, they know it's difficult, so they, they offer very high commissions, sometimes 10, 15 percent. You know, we know who's getting rich on these things. Anyway, uh, we want you to know, that is what, uh, this is my, my sales pitch for today. When I started the Financial Education Foundation, and it's there for newly born children. It's right there. To death. Oh, it is right there. We want to teach people the stuff they need to know. Do not call me for the purpose of asking for investment advice. That would be illegal. I'm not licensed. I try to give nudges in the articles and the Q and A's that we do. And nudge can be powerful too, I think. But an education is number one. Everything we do is about getting people to take the right fork in the road. Some of those come with enough tables, you don't care. But our job is to assume that every potential reader could be a, a first time or could be a STEM person who just loves the tables. Anyway, that's what we do, and it's, it's, and it's an entirely different business than what Tom and Don and their folks are doing. They are doing the heavy lifting. I don't know if that's true. And um, by the way, so the, the foundation is all money either out of your pocket or other people that support it. So yeah. if you want to help people get educated, into the future, you you can give it right there, that's, right at the that's website. That's very right. nice. No, yeah. so please. And please we do not. I do not take a penny out of it. I, I and, and the if you ever watch one of our, where Daryl and Chris are in a podcast or or on a YouTube piece with me, these these people are also a, a totally volunteer. Mm -hmm. They they are engineers, and they bring so much more than I can. Uh, to the conversation, so I hope you'll I hope you'll join us. All right, stay right there. We're going to do questions in just a minute. Oh, so, good. for those who would like some help, we we give you a couple of easy ways to do this, either online. Uh, you can go to talkingrealmoney.com and uh, meet an advisor. For those of you here joining us, we give you the nice form I showed you earlier, which I can't find, but it's here. Oh, it's right here. Uh, please fill and please fill this out and whether you want our help or not by the way and, and answer any questions or uh, things you think we could do better here and for the people online as well if you want to ask a question there's a chat box there but you have to scroll down a little bit I guess on the page to get to that so um, please do that as well